late in the winter this year. Um, you know, Anthony, who is such a wonderful connector, um, had been on the farm here having potlucks every month. And we decided, well, you know, they're so wonderful, such collegiality and fellowship. Why don't we build them up into something, you know, a little more extensive? And because there's people always love to eat, and especially th those potlucks have such amazing, some of the best whole food plant-based variety that you can find. We decided to make like a little day out of it and then bring in wonderful world-renowned speakers, show the people who come here really what is involved in the uh, provision of good, healthy food and how you get it because it occurs on a farm. So we wrapped all of those things up together into this farm day. So we now have a, we're, we're very fortunate to have a project which is called the Ethos Farm Project. And we are so grateful that this project has, includes these Ethos Farm Days in addition to two other um, activities that we run on here on the farm. And this Ethos Farm Project is now fiscally sponsored by Plant Pure Communities, which is the nonprofit uh, that was founded by Nelson Campbell, son of Dr. and Mrs. Campbell. So this Ethos Farm Project, which consists of these events, also helps to support uh, Andrew, the young farmer, whose produce you see in our uh, farm stand. Um, and we, a couple of years ago, we began to realize that um, in the New York metropolitan area, there's almost no farmland left. There are millions and millions of people living here. And in northern New Jersey, this valley is probably, because it's been preserved because of, of, of its prime farmland, is probably the most intact agricultural setting closest to New York. So we much of this farmland, even though it's preserved, it's not growing food. It is growing uh, Monsanto GMO feed corn and soybean to go to CAFOs to raise hamburgers. Or it has horses on it. So we came into this valley with the idea of trying to grow food without harming the environment. And because young farmers, and there are not many of them, have nowhere to go now in this area, we decided to start giving our land to young farmers. And we give them, you know, it's hard to make a living when you're a farmer, especially if you're young starting out. So we give them housing as well. We give them the original stone house that the settlers um, built when they came to this land. We give them mentorship under the state's finest organic farmer, who is Nora Puglisi, who you met on the farm tour. And Nora doesn't just teach this, the young farmers about um, how to grow. She also helps to develop them from a prof in other professional ways, uh, like setting up a business, a corporation, um, how to get certification and fill out paperwork and, and so on and so forth. So it's a long process. Uh, so the Young Farmers Incubator Program, the Ethos Farm Days, and then something I just wanted uh, to tell you about, which is extremely exciting, especially in view of the UN's meeting uh, a week ago or so, at which climate was the topic. Um, do any of you know about uh, what the Rodale Institute is? Yes. Okay. Rodale Institute, which is about 45 minutes west of here in Cutstown, Pennsylvania, is the originator of the word organic as it applies to food and farming. And it was their philosophy that the USDA took and turned into organic certification, USDA organic, um, which has been, you know, not ideal, uh, but it is, it does offer some 
uh, some uh, procedures and policies that guarantee that you are getting, you know, food that that is grown in a certain way. So the last piece of this farm, uh, I know the piece that you all can see here is actually a very tiny piece of the farm. You're only looking at about maybe 5% of it. 95% of the farm is that way. And half of it is covered with forests from which the Raritan River springs. And that enormous field when you drove in is the last piece that's conventionally farmed. And at the end of this December, this land will finally come off lease from a farmer who holds it. It is our land, but it's been sprayed with chemicals uh, and um, for many decades. And uh, we are collaborating with Rodale Institute and Rutgers University to reestablish the native um, prairie grasses that were growing here when European settlers came because there is emerging evidence that the native grasses were the secret to taking carbon from the atmosphere and burying it in the soil. A lot of people don't recognize that the reason why we face annihilation from climate change is because mankind has broken the carbon cycle. Carbon, there's a cycle of, of carbon that goes from the air through plants Plants put it into the ground where it is stored. And because we have, um, do not farm in a good way, and because we've, uh, we've uh, destroyed a lot of the habitat, including much of the grassland in this country, we've lost the ability for our soils to store carbon. Based on Rodale's work and others, there's exciting um, prospects that if, the, if we could restore good farmland and with these grasses and then plant in regenerative matters, manners that have been developed by Rodale that we could reverse CO2 levels in the atmosphere to pre-industrial era revolution levels despite the fossil fuels we burn. So we'll be excited to begin on this project next spring. That is the third leg of our um, Ethos Farm project. Uh, you can find out more about it um, by going to our website. On the home page, there's an Ethos Farm project. Uh, if you'd like to help support our cause, uh, that would be wonderful. And I just wanted to bring up Jody Cass, who is our you know, guide in all of this. She is the director of Plant Pure Communities. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, inviting me to say a few words. He didn't tell me he was going to do this, so I'm not as prepared as I might be. Um, um, uh, Dr. Campbell actually introduced um, us to, um, to Dr. Weiss and um, Ethos Farm, and um, really what a national treasure this place is. Um, it is, um, uh, I, I serve on the board of directors of the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies, and I'm also the executive director of the nonprofit Plant Pure Communities, which is the organization uh, created um, by uh, uh, Nelson Campbell, Dr. Uh, Dr. Campbell's eldest son. Um, and we are working in communities um, to try and help spread the message of, um, of health and, and, and healing uh, for people and, and the planet. Um, we were delighted when we, uh, we were asked to partner with um, Ethos Farm. Um, Ethos Health and Ron, and um, the last time I was here, it was I think a, probably about 100 degrees. I don't know if we could either too cold or too hot, too hot, too cold or too hot. Every time we're here, uh, it was when Dr. Esselstyn spoke, and at the um, it was actually right in front of that building there that we entered into a um, an agreement, a fiscal sponsor agreement, so that folks um, can make donations and um, receive tax deductions to the extent allowed by law. Um, and um, it's important to know, you know, there's this, this place is really, really special. Uh, it, the service it does to the community and also to our planet um, is really extraordinary. Um, but there's no funding for it. Uh, this is all coming from the benefit of, um, really, from, uh, from Dr. Weiss, which is extraordinary. 
Um, but we are just so pleased to be partnering with this, with this, with the uh, on the Ethos Farm project. Um, and we encourage you all to um, to, to um, uh, give the support, to make a donation. You'll be receiving a letter, um, and you can, when you do make the donation, you can receive tax deduction through the through the nonprofit. So I know my husband and I have already made a few donations. We'll be making some more, and I encourage you to join us. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for attending. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I feel like I'm at home, uh, coming from a farm as I did. But, uh, but before starting, I do want to make a comment about uh, Dr. Weiss. Um, he is really a pioneer, in my view. Uh, I heard, first heard... I first learned of him in a New York newspaper. I can't remember which one, but the story was told that how he, as a physician, decided that food was important somehow and got this farm going. And uh, that really intrigued me because I came from a, from a farm myself, growing up in milk and cows, I have to say, of this part of the story. Uh, but in any case, um, it, it, the whole story harks back to my childhood, in, in a sense. Uh, because when I was raised on a farm, we didn't have pesticides. We weren't using chemicals at that time. And uh, life was simple. It was nice. It was a family farm. And so the whole social atmosphere regarding that time, uh, in a sense, was just something really precious. And I've seen these major changes just during my lifetime that's not exactly going in the right direction. So when Ron sort of uh, got this thing going, he said, wow. We're sort of going back to the time when we should have been, and we should have retained it. Um, so uh, to get on with the time here, uh, I, I've got about 63 years worth of work to talk about in 63 minutes. <laughs> no, it's, it's really hard. I, it was over 63 years ago that I uh, got involved in research in this area when I started my graduate program at Cornell University. And uh, at that time, um, I, I started out someplace quite a bit from where I am now, but let me start turning on the slides here and to help me out here a bit about this. The, the, you notice the title that I gave to Ron for this is, I think, a fairly significant idea. Namely, why is nutrition ignored in medicine? Well, quite frankly, from my perspective, nutrition is ignored by everybody, <laughs> uh, including me too, when I started out. And so the challenge that we have this, this day and time is somehow to get that concept, that, that concept called nutrition, and I'm thinking about the sort of scientific basis for nutrition in a sense, to get that concept really restored and understood. Because we have so much power in that concept to do so much good. And so I'm gonna talk about the nutrition, especially my own, uh, barring from my own journey as I got into research. So, um, as I said, I started out on a farm. I do have a picture of it there. <laughs> Um, my two brothers and I, uh, one of the brothers, yeah, he's not here now. That's right, I forgot about that. But in any case, uh, each of us had a combine. My dad had the farm, of course, and we worked a way uh, to go to school by earning some money by going around and combining some grain. Uh, that was a little while ago, a few years ago. Can you see that? Is that clear? From my eyesight here, it's not very clear. <laughs> Wait, that's not quite right. Right, let's start something else here. Can we, the presentation starts? Yeah, I, I got to turn on the, you know, the, uh, it's not that. I'm just trying to start myself, hold on. Somebody say something? Hey, hospital. Okay, that, that's okay. Never mind. It works. If you can see it, I hope you can see it. Um, in any case, as I say, that's seven, eight years ago or so. Uh, then when I went away to school to Cornell University, uh, I actually uh, did my doctoral dis uh, dissertation on uh, doing some experiments with my professor mentors doing some experiments to actually promote 
the consumption of that precious nutrient, animal-based protein. So that's the side of the fence I was on. Coming from a farm, milking cows in order to get that protein-rich food, coming to graduate school, and then started my research career on actually doing research to actually promote the development of producing animal protein more efficiently. That was the idea. Uh, then shortly thereafter, after getting my first faculty position at, Cornell, at uh, Virginia Tech, actually, I was asked to sort of uh, be in charge or coordinate a program in the Philippines, State Department funded project, that was intended to develop a model for feeding malnourished children in poor countries. And at that time, uh, it, the popular idea was that we had malnourished children in poor countries because they weren't getting enough protein. So that fit in with exactly where I came from. Uh, protein is important, let's get some protein. Um, and uh, that was quite an experience. I, I did that for about 10 years, sort of advising on, on that program. Uh, but then I learned something along the way that it wasn't quite square with what I thought I would see. Namely, uh, I learned from my colleagues, my medical colleagues, playing golf one day, actually, uh, that uh, they were operating some children with liver cancer, four years of age and younger. Really odd. I mean, liver cancer is not exactly occurring at that age. I also had a, ch a responsibility for setting up a laboratory in Manila, analyzing for a compound in peanuts that has a compound called aflatoxin that causes liver cancer. So the, the idea was, from my perspective, from my friend's perspective, that the liver cancer, which was high in the Philippines in general, was probably due to the aflatoxin. So we were going about analyzing for aflatoxin. Uh, it was high there, but then I happened to see something a little bit different. I won't go into all the details of that, but I got the impression that maybe it's not the aflatoxin that's causing the liver cancer. It might be protein. So in reality, uh, it led to this sort of notion, more protein, more cancer, that's odd. I mean, here I'm coming from the background of pushing protein, closing the protein gap, as we said in those days. Uh, yet at the same time, we had a little hint that there was some trouble here. We wanted to use peanuts as a source of protein in our program. But if peanuts are contaminated with aflatoxin, that wasn't quite screwy. So that's really what led to some re my research, which was entirely funded by the public taxpayers through the years, I should say. Uh, most of it, but 90% of the funding that we got, we got generous amounts of funding over the years, was from you folks, or before <laughs> your, your ancestors, I actually have to say now, uh, the, the, from the public taxpayer. So I didn't take any funding through the years from industry. It was all from NIH for the most part, and similar organizations like that. So. In that sort of journey, getting this impression that liver, that protein might be causing might be more important for lung, causing liver cancer than aflatoxin, right? Uh, it turned out I saw this paper here that was published in the 1960s, came out about that time, uh, where these researchers in India also were aware that aflatoxin causes liver cancer, right? But they wanted to see if feeding more protein could prevent the formation of the liver cancer. <coughs> So was the reputation of protein. Protein is everything, might prevent cancer. So they did this little study here. It's an animal study in this particular case. Fed animals, uh, fed two different levels of protein. Both animals had been, these are rats actually in this study. Both were exposed to the same amount of the carcinogen, which was the aflatoxin. Um, and so they did the study starting out with the same amount of carcinogen exposure fed them two different levels of protein, just quite, really quite simple, and got results exactly the opposite what they thought they were going to see. The animals getting the higher levels of protein all got to cancer. I mean, that was just like a hundred and nothing score, if you will. It was, it was a kind of thing that uh, is, it's very convincing, I thought, and that was equivalent to what I thought I was seeing in, in the kids that I, I was there as well. So that's really what led to the idea, let's go and have a look at this, because if we're going to use protein to actually make for health in, in some way, we better solve this problem. So that's what led to, led to my research in the early days. And I'm going to show you just a couple of slides here, a couple of pictures of some of the results that really intrigued me early on. 
and set me on the path that I started. Namely, uh, this again is their study in uh, experimental animals, rats, if you will. Uh, and it's basically sort of considering the growth of tumors in the first 12 weeks of this particular experiment. The growth of tumors started with a carcinogen, aflatoxin, right? Fed different levels of protein, the 5% and 20%. And so basically we think 20% and those cancers are growing well in the first 12 weeks. These are precancerous lesions to be more specific about it. But in any case, there was a cancer was looking like it was growing well, the 20% as what the Indian workers had done. By the way, I should tell you too, the Indian researchers, they got the results they did, but they didn't believe them. And they went back and did the study a second time with an entirely different design to show that in fact it was the opposite. Such was the reputation of protein. I mean, protein, protein causing cancer, that's ridiculous. And so they didn't believe their own research. And it wasn't until some 25 years later when I was invited to India to speak there uh, having taken a different path that they finally sort of came around to that idea. But here's the, the study here, 20% cancer is growing well, feed 5% the cancer is not growing, in spite of the fact they had been exposed to a very potent, potent carcinogen. I mean, that's actually pretty spectacular. It's the early stages. Then we did all kinds of studies over the next 27 years, actually, uh, doing, looking at this question from many different perspectives because it was hard to digest, I hate to use the word, uh, these kind of results early on that protein was going to turn on cancer. Nobody really believed that. That was kind of silly, if you will. So we did some things like this. We, we decided during this first 12-week period to switch the protein back and forth to see if we might make a difference. And so there, in the first three weeks, if you will, the protein the cancer is growing with the higher levels of protein, switched them to 5%, the lower levels, and by the way, that 5%, 20%, as you may know, is more or less the range that uh, describes our situation too. Some of us get a little higher than 20%, not too often. Most of us get at least five, we get close to the 10. So anyhow, there's a turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. That was dramatic, I think you can agree. Uh, I mean, not only were we finding and confirming that the higher protein actually causes cancer to grow, but we can turn cancer on and off, which incidentally is a very exciting idea itself. The idea that cancer maybe can be turned on and off by nutritional means, instead of relying just on the idea that it's only the genes, that's a very provocative idea still. We're struggling with that today, to, to uh, some people are. Uh, so we can turn off and turn cancer on and off. So, the next thing that I thought was important to know, uh, being in research as I am, uh, is those of us who are involved in this kind of work, we, if we see something really crazy like this, especially, we want to know what is the mechanism, the biochemical mechanism, if you will, what causes this to work that way? I mean, it's hard enough to, to consider this as realistic findings, but we, we have to really know how does this work and it can help us to sort of appreciate what's going on here. What I'm showing here is a, uh, is a sort of a timeline of cancer development from the left. Uh, during a stage we call initiation, that's when cancer is started by mutations. Chemicals come in and they you know, bind to the DNA, if you will, and starts with mutations. Then it goes through a long period, in the case of the humans, maybe many years where the cancers are starting to grow a little bit but a little bit but a little bit over the years. And the last one is called progression, and that's of course the stage during which people generally recognize they have a problem. And it may be diagnosed as cancer, obviously. So that's the scheme that we used in research to describe this cancer process. Initiation, promotion, progression. Okay? So I wanted to see during these stages what is the biochemical mechanism. I'm a biochemist but by, by, by training. And that's what we tend to do, especially in the, the pharmaceutical industry or in any other industry. When we see a cause and effect relationship like that, we want to know how it works. So I started looking for that. And I had a number of graduate students over the years. And I'd like to say I, I, I used up about 10 to 12 graduate students during that period of time for their PhD thesis working on this. So we had a lot of, I had a lot of people working on, on this program. Uh, we looked for a mechanism. We looked at the first stage. And I'm not going to go into the details here, simply going to point out that we looked 
uh, uh, each one of those were usually involved in PhD thesis on a part of a graduate student. Typically, it'd be three or four years to do that kind of work. But in any case, uh, I just listed there at the bottom, without going into detail, some possible mechanisms to explain this crazy protein effect. I'll just mention one. The first one is this increases cell entry to the carcinogen. What we let found was that the carcinogen is there when the high protein is being fed. It increases the rate at which the carcinogen gets into the cell. Okay, that was a kind of an exciting idea, and I thought, well, maybe that's the answer. That's what, what's going on here. But why? So we decided to continue to look more for more mechanisms, and I listed a bunch there uh, to see what the high protein diet did. Studying each of those in some detail. And it turned out that if it, 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 with each one of those um, mechanisms, supposedly, we did enough work to convince ourselves that was real. And it turned out that there's five mechanisms there that could account for this effect. And in the high protein situation, all of them got turned on. It wasn't just one, it was all of them, simultaneously. So then we said, oh, right, let's go to the second stage. So we continued to look for a mechanism. I was, I was hunting for the mechanism. Mind you, if we can identify the mechanism so that the way it goes, if we can identify the mechanism in something like this, maybe we can develop a drug to stop it. Okay, that was the idea. So we looked at five more at the second stage, and again, all of them did the same thing. There was a couple of them on there that are actually, they act in, to protect us against cancer. What did the high protein do in that case? It turned it off. So we got a couple of good things that are working in our behavior, and the high protein diet actually compromises that activity. So, you know, at 10 times, looking at this, actually there were probably, I could count 12, uh, altogether, every time we did that kind of study, we found out that all those different mechanisms did the same thing at the end of the day. When the high protein is fed, the cancer forms by multiple, multiple mechanisms. And here, of course, we only just did 10. But it led to, I have to jump way ahead. This was really one of the most provocative things I think we saw over the years. That nutrition, even a single nutrient, doesn't work to cause an effect by a single mechanism. What we were seeing here was that for this one nutrient, in this case protein, it could be described, in fact, could be described by multiple mechanisms operating together. I call it a, a, a tsunami of mechanisms. That is a very different view of nutrition than what's generally understood. So nutrition doesn't operate by this nutrient doing that and here's the mechanism. Then we go look at another. It doesn't work that way. Nutrients work together as in a big, big comprehensive sort of fashion. So I'm going to jump in here again. I'm skipping, skipping over a whole lot of stuff. But in any case, it got to the point where there was no question that protein, and I should say animal protein, the protein we were using to cause the cancer to be turned on was the main protein of cow's milk. So from my background, you know, all of a sudden, the main protein of cow's milk turning on cancer? Wait a minute, this is too much. We tried plant protein, and it didn't do it, even when it was fed at the higher levels. So all of a sudden, there was another sort of principle, if, we, if you will, that really turned out to be striking. Namely, only animal proteins, even though we didn't use the others, there were other research that supported this, animal proteins tend to turn on the cancer. Lots of other things I'll mention in a moment. Plant proteins don't. So there, as I say, was another significant observation. We could, you know, turn cancer on and off by protein, and but it was the animal protein that did it, not the plant protein. But of course, you know, foods have more than protein, as you know. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for a moment, just to tell you this this story here. Because it was actually more than just the protein. The protein was a good indicator. It was one of the main a actors in this, in this operation. So we eventually got to a point where I got uh, this idea that, uh, you know, we ought to be eating plants. In fact, I came up with that idea. I should tell you this is a side story. The plant-based idea. I actually uh, framed that word in about 1980 or 81 uh, at a time when I was on a committee of the National Cancer Institute that evaluates applications for research. 
And so there were about, you know, 13 to 15 of us, I, I don't know. I was the only on that committee that determines what kind of cancer research should be done. The others were all pathologists and, and biochemists and molecular biologists and so forth. I was the only one in the area of nutrition. So in about 1980 or so, um, you know, I, I was getting the grants that was suggesting maybe nutrition might be involved in cancer. And, but my colleagues, not being in nutrition, didn't understand what was going on here. So I spent some time and they asked me to, to the next meeting to spend a couple of hours talking to them about what I thought all this was. It had to do with antioxidants in those days. And as I was sitting there thinking, I have to tell you, to be honest about it, I, didn't, I, I knew the word vegetarian. I didn't do this work because of, I, I had an interest in vegetarianism. And so it, it, I was going to describe them, here's what nutrition way it works, it's pointed to plants. And I had to come up with something quickly. I didn't want to use the word vegetarian. I didn't even know the word veganism at that time. And so I came up with the word plant-based, very awkward. It's not, I have to say it's not a very not forthright word, I guess in a sense. But that's where the word came from because I didn't want to actually leave the impression that I was doing this from an, um, even as good as, as great as it is, an ethical point of view, or sort of uh, that idea was basically to just follow the science. That's where the whole food plant-based diet really came from. The whole was added on to, uh, about a year later to uh, sort of emphasize something else. Anyhow, whole food plant-based. When I got around to writing this book, uh, the China study, and during 2002, to, so a couple of years with my youngest son, Tom, uh, we uh, basically uh, started looking back to the literature. I was getting excited at that time in 2002 that, you know, especially after having done a big study in China that many of you know about. Uh, but in any case, I was getting excited about what all this was showing. And it was showing to me in a rather grand way that it wasn't just about protein. Yes, animal protein was a signal of the kind of food we should not eat. Plant protein was a signal of the kind of food we should be eating. And so I got back in the, went back into the literature as we were writing the China study to want to know just, just simply, I mean, I'm learning too. I mean, I came from a, a time when we as scientists would look at one thing at a time, that sort of thing. I wanted to know if there was any evidence in the previous literature in medicine to indicate that something like this might be occurring. And so I got involved in going back in the literature, and it turned out, and this was the time we wrote the book, it turned out that all these diseases here, as you can see, seem to respond in the same way. That was an eye-opener, too. That was very exciting. I mean, some of these diseases are obviously serious. Some of them more of the nuisance characteristic, maybe. But in any case, there was some literature, there was some information in the literature, and the scientists had not paid attention to it. So we just, I just listed it there because what that indicates in turn is something really important, I think. Namely, look up the lower left hand corner. The effect, this effect is broad. I'm talking about cancer just up until now, and a specific kind of cancer. I'm talking about one nutrient, if you will. But as we started surveying around, looking at other nutrients and other diseases, uh, all of these here respond the same way to the same idea, the same strategy. That is an exciting idea. And that is exactly the antithesis of what we do now in medicine. When we try to think of one chemical causing something, and we oftentimes think of one chemical to use to treat something called medicines or drugs. So all of a sudden, I'm on a different path. You know, with this idea that nutrition is very broad in scope, that is, a, that is a sharp distinction between what we traditionally use in our, our society now. So there, it's broad, very fast, very fast. And I know many of you have experienced this. You can see results from this thing within almost certainly within a week or two. Cholesterol starts going down and many other things start to change. So the whole idea is really quite spectacular that uh, we have this broad effect and very profound, it's fast and that sort of thing. Um, and so the diet, if the, in the dietary change, this is not a, just a drug protocol. Okay, I'll do it for a couple weeks and go back to my old ways. No. The idea is, all of you know, it's, it has to be sustained. It's a way of life. It's a whole lifestyle. And so when it's sustained, then we end up seeing the long-term results that we tend to see. And all you need to do is look at some of the literature 
as to what people, what kind of disease they get, say at age 60, 70, 80, and you can there see the trends. You can see the results of those who tend to eat better, lower disease. So it all kind of hangs together from the early stages until the later stages. So that was kind of exciting. It leads to a new idea of involvedness that I think is really going to be the future as far as discussion is concerned. You know, we think about nutrition used, being used to prevent future diseases. You know, your grandmothers told you, eat your veggies, <laughs> so forth. We've heard that more or less for quite a long time. But in reality, we keep talking about nutrition being a useful thing to prevent disease. Young people don't particularly care about that idea. They'll all be, if I get that later on, that's, you know the story. What I'm finding here, and this is a really exciting idea, is I think, this kind of nutrition not only has a broad effect on preventing disease, more importantly, this kind of nutrition can be used as a means of treatment. Now I'm stepping on some toes. I've stepped on many in my life, but uh, basically to say that nutrition can be used to treat disease, you have a problem, you change, you get results. That's treatment. So it's time that we start talking about this nutritional thing as a means of treatment, as even a primary means of treatment. And, and then furthermore, it has this very broad sort of effect, if you will. Now, just skipping over some more ideas here. A lot of people, when this first came out, these ideas were first coming out, and I was on some of the national panels, in fact, that was making these kind of recommendations. The thought was at that time, oh, yeah, which nutrient is it? Which nutrient is it? This is back in the 80s. Uh, and there was an inclination to say, oh, it's this beta carotene, or is this nutrient, or that nutrient. And so there were some studies undertaken at the time. Let's test beta carotene because that's in plants. Maybe we can use that to prevent cancer. Or maybe we can use it, maybe even to slow cancer down, if you will. So a study was underdone with beta carotene. Uh, we saw something different. There are 29,000 people in this study. These are all heavy smokers. And the thought was that smokers who consume more plants actually have a lower rate of getting lung cancer, by the way. They really do. And that was seen first because the ones who can have the most beta carotene, which comes from plants, the ones who had the most beta carotene in their blood to get less, less lung cancer. So there was a study done, let's try beta carotene, let's put it in a pill, this is what happens here. So they did that and they wanted to do it for eight years with heavy smokers and here's the results they got. The food beta carotene, as they say, that when, when you're eating food with beta carotene and, and the blood goes up, it goes up in the blood a little bit, your risk of getting cancer is lower. But when you put the beta carotene in the pill, something different happens. In this study here, the ones consuming more food beta carotene decreased their lung cancer rates by 19%. That's significant, it's statistically significant, it's very interesting. That's been done and shown a few different ways. However, when you put it in the form of a pill, it increased lung cancer. <laughs> so, it leads to this. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff here but to, to illustrate this point. When a nutrient's in food, it does the right thing or the wrong thing, whatever the case may be. When it's in food, it acts in a certain way because it's acting with all the other nutrients there too with it. When you take it out and put it in a pill, it doesn't work, mostly. You might see some short-term effects. Yes, we see some short-term effects occasionally, but that is really what led to the vitamin supplement industry. And I followed the, that industry very closely because in the 1980s, when the industry was first getting started, there had been an industry before that, but I was on a, a panel, a National Academy panel in the 1980-82, where we were making recommendations to change diet. And we we're being very modest, quite frankly, but in any case, we actually said in our executive summary, this does not apply to individual nutrients. We were spe specific about 1982. But there were some entrepreneurs out there, energetic entrepreneurs, who saw in our report the opportunity to take these nutrients out and put them in a pill. And so the industry kind of got going. It was a very robust industry started out in the beginning. The National Academy of Science did not like what they were seeing because they were distorting what we said. They took our front page ads on the Times the Magazine and Newsweek and all that stuff. And so uh, they went to court. The National Academy went to court. Namely, in this case, the Federal Trade Commission Court. 
and tried to block them from making that silly claim. And so I was asked to be the principal one representing the academy on the stand for three years sort of contesting or at least being asked to verify their claim. So I, with that experience I had at that time, I really became very much aware of what food industry can do. Uh, I won't tell you the rest of the story, but uh, in any case, they started in the middle 80s and at, 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 at to build an industry. And there were, there were lots of legislation in, in order at that time to prevent those kind of claims. But they worked hard over the next 10 years or so to change some of the regulations. And they did change the regulations. That's the birth of the vitamin supplement industry. And so now we're seeing lots of studies showing that vitamins, quite frankly, don't necessarily do what we think they're going to do, and they do the exactly the opposite. So this is not exactly the message. <laughs> it's whole food. That's one of the reasons I come back to the whole food idea. Uh, and then, then toward, when was it, 1990 or so, when our study from China was being first reported in the New York Times and uh, other places, I don't have a chance to get into that, but I'm getting excited about this whole idea there's a whole different world here talking about nutrition in a form of whole foods rather than supplements. And in any case, I get a phone call one day after it came out in the New York Times from this guy by the name Esselton. <laughs> he wanted me to come in to his uh, conference he was holding. He had been getting some results, interestingly, too, that with heart disease patients, he was seeing a, a pretty good effect with a low-fat diet. He called it low-fat. He was, well, I won't say that. <laughs> He wasn't focused on the protein, but in any case, uh, he was getting some results that were interesting. And he wanted to become a speaker, so we did, and one thing led to another. He and I, as you may know, we've spoken a lot. We're very good friends. Uh, we're, we're basically thinking the same way. Uh, some people like to point out differences we have, but <laughs> never mind. So <laughs> Dr. Esselton, um, he, he got these re really fantastic results. And I saw this, and I said, this is fantastic. I'm seeing the stuff in animals. I'm seeing some related evidence from our study in China, you know, the big human study there. But to actually see somebody actually do this with people and see what he was it, that's what he was doing. And I find it very exciting. Of course, I learned about Dean Ornish as well. So Ornish and Esselton and John McDougall, he was doing this without publishing, you know, doing it his own way with some other diseases. We all became good friends. So. Esselton then eventually went on to do a study that was published in uh, 2014, I think, more recently, involving, uh, I think he, he had something like 100 patients that had visited him since he retired, and they visited with him privately, and so he set it up, and many of you may know Dr. Esselton's work, uh, his thing, what he does at his place, uh, but he had a bunch of people together and, and he told them this story, do it this way, see what you get, all heart patients, all heart patients. He went back then after between, let's see, it was two to seven years after he had done this. And he picks up the phone and he says, he said, are you still doing this? And so, yeah, 90, 89%, yeah, they were. I mean, they had some motivation to do it, admittedly. But in any case, they were still doing it, which is a good rate of compliance, I have to say. So he had a chance then to ask these people who had done this for two to seven years, how is your heart problems occurring? He got some results out of that. That's what just says. So two to seven years later, it was 177 said they were doing it. 19 said they were not. So he just simply asked the 119 who were doing it, what was their, their, their uh, situation compared to the 19. It turned out that 89% had said that. It turned out amongst this, and if any of you have heard Dr. Estelton talk about this, the most recent sort of compilation of evidence, the ones, the 177 who did it, not one, only one person over the next two to seven years had another heart event. Actually, someone I knew was a friend of mine who his wife told me he wasn't quite compliant. <laughs> but in any case, uh, the, there's one case in there that, uh, and, and, and one, one just less than one percent. There was 67 percent of the people, you know, who said they didn't do it. I didn't follow this stuff. 70, 70, I mean, 67% uh, had another heart attack and I think a couple of deaths in there. Nothing could be more spectacular than something like this. You know, on the one hand, people doing this and this is what it's very self to get. And of course, Dr. Weiser knows this well and that's the message here, that same sort of message is 
do it right, and we get all these results. Okay, now I want to just take you through a little. Can I? How much time do I have? How much time do I have? As much as you want. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I get carried away. I could talk about it all day long, but anyhow. So I'm, I'm going to show you something here that uh, putting all this together and some other stuff that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, and from my perspective, being in science, being working inside of cells, if you will, that sort of thing, I want to know too how what that mechanism is. First, before telling you what my views on this, I want to just show you theoretically what happens when you eat. You eat food and you've got some nutrients, right? It goes to your stomach, it gets digested. That means all the nutrients in the food are being released and they go their own way, they get absorbed and so forth. So let me run that through for you real quick. Here I just created some stages of, of uh, what happened to that uh, nutrient. All well, down through it's absorbed and transported and so forth and so on. These are all events, one following the other. And it turns out that um, for each of those stages, going from stage one to stage two or stage three, you know, the amount that goes from, the, the amount that's digested, for example, from the food can vary by 20%, and that's an underestimate. There's a lot of variation. Then it goes to the next stage being absorbed. Of the amount that's digested, it's 20% there, variation goes, gets absorbed. And you go through that for a few stages, what it says to me is that there's no way under the sun that is in science, I don't care if it's now or it's a thousand years from now, there's no way under the sun that we as scientists can say ever that we know exactly how much nutrient we consume goes to its functional site. In other words, we consume a certain amount of food. It's digested. But from that point until the nutrient actually does its work, wherever it happens to be in the body, it's adjusted all along the way every nanosecond. It's amazing. And we can't, we can't do this with, we can't take math and try to figure out if I eat this much, I get this much effect, you know, at the cellular level. That just doesn't work that way. Uh, that's just for one theoretical one. Even if we could do that, it all changes when we add another nutrient to it. And let's say we could theoretically know that for a bunch of nutrients and we know exactly how much is at the site, you know, according to how much we eat. It changes in the next nanosecond. I can tell you that every single one of us here, this is going on now, and so it's going on as a so-called metabolism, if you will. And the body is choosing to do with each of these nutrients what it wants to do. There's a wisdom in the body. There's a wisdom in the body that determines you know, what shall become of the nutrients we're consuming. You know, whether to set it here or there, how much, you know, what, what kind of reaction. It's infinitely complex. And here we are, you know, in sort of modern science, modern medicine, talking about this nutrient. If we consume this much of this, you get this much of an effect. There's some general relationship, but that doesn't, that's not the way it works. Once again, emphasizing the point I like to make. Nutrition is not about single nutrients. However much you consume, whatever it is, it's really about the whole gamish. All we need to do is something really simple, really simple. Just consume a whole food plant-based diet. Let the body do the rest. All we need to do, just do that. And in the process, I'll just one more thought, and that is don't consume food that has animal protein in it. Now, that's a big statement. I know it's a big statement. It was for me because I'm coming up to the farm. The foods that have animal protein in it, well, like, guess what? You know, they got hooves and so forth. That we're, we're talking about consuming uh, animals. And that's not where, as I say, I started from, but that's where I'm ending up at. And the, the story about protein itself, the mythology of protein, I call it the cult of protein. Now I have a new book just coming out where I'm tracing back in history and time. Where did that cult come from? So there's two ideas I, I would leave. Eat whole food. Eat whole food, eat it in that form. Secondly, don't use the whole food that has animal protein in it. It's really simple. When I, and, and that's all I, one needs to say. And you can, you can address a lot of problems if you do it right 
And when I say whole foods, that doesn't mean adding oil, salt, and sugar. Those are three addictive tastes that we've all become accustomed to in our convenience foods, if you, if you like. So the idea is really pretty simple. The story biochemically is very complex. We've got to admit that. But the story is simple. We can't take complexity and try to describe it by one single event or one single nutrient. That's, that's really being risky. It's very, it's very simple. And we have lots of variety of different kinds of plants. You choose what you like. Use some spices and herbs and stuff like that in order to keep your favorite taste in order. That meets the ethnic cuisine ideas and the distinctive parts of that. So it's a simple message. We're letting, we're letting science get too much in the way sometimes and talking about specific details that we need not talk about. Okay, now I'm going to go for this. This is crazy little thing. Here's a, I just tell you, I, I got onto this for myself by just looking at the cell. I felt like I used to crawl around inside of a cell. <laughs> We've worked with so many different parts of the cell, just wondering. And what is added, what comes out of this, that we got 10 to 100 trillion cells in our body. We can't see them. You can't, they can sit on the head of a pin, we can't see it. All these cells, each one of them is like a universe, enormously complex. Can you imagine having 10 to 100 trillion universes in your body, all doing their thing, and doing it in a nice coordinated way? Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Because when I look at the biochemistry, you know, it, it puts me in a different world, an entirely different world. And that, as I say, we've got to respect nature, if you will, that's a good idea. Because somehow nature has sort of resolved that problem and put that together for us. And so anyhow, um, it's like a micro universe. I'm going off, off the chart here a bit. Uh, and the other, there's something else that's going on too that I, I, I find exciting. And this has been known in science for some time. Cells talk to each other. You know, what this cell does here, the other cells know about it somehow. And then cells are in organs, and there's clusters of cells and so forth and so on. There's a lot of communication going on. And so the body is all the time at this micro, micro, micro level is making choices. It's making choices of what do I do with this, what do I do with that, what do I add to this and that. It's not just like a recipe, it's just a dynamic, fascinating uh, sort of uh, illustration of, of nature, if I may say it that way. Uh, now, just a couple more things here too. I'm, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is this. I, I think, as every time I look at least, I'm trying to figure out what is this idea called holism, or whole food, as opposed to reductionism, which is taking things apart. And there's different ways of explaining this. And here, here is one that I think you, many of you may know. I don't. How many have heard of the Krebs cycle? Oh, I'm a bunch of educated people here. Jeez. <laughs> uh, anyhow, there, there it is. It's the first part, the first stage of, of uh, the biochemistry, if you will. Uh, we get our energy from the sun. We all know that. The sun shines on the plants and creates sugars. So the energy of the sun, solar energy is converted into chemical energy in a form of chemical bonds. So the, the energy from the sun comes down, creates uh, nice, creates plants, right? That's where all, all the energy goes. And one of the principal starting points, it creates a compound called glucose. And so we eat the plants. And then, then uh, and during that time right here, you can see, oh, sorry. Oh, that didn't mean to do that. Uh, that's the series of reactions that goes on. We're obviously not going to get into that here, but I was teaching biochemistry back in the 60s when I was having fun talking to students about the emerging, this emerging pathways. It's a lot of fun on that, learning each step along the way and each enzyme that's involved and so forth and so on. We used to have charts on the walls, those of us in research, and just sort of like, we had the latest chart with the newest stuff. Anyhow, then a few years passed and we got that. <laughs> I gave up. Because all of a sudden it's saying to me, this is so, I mean, this is so extraordinarily complex. These reactions are in the millions, in the millions, you know, permutations and combinations of this and that and everything else working together. Uh, then you can't see it, that was intended. So it's just, <laughs> I've had it. <laughs> How can you take one thing out of that whole mix and then create some result and then say that's the whole? Doesn't work. 
it's really, really kind of ridiculous, just on the scientific pace of it. So I want to show you with what, how we've taken that path, though, nonetheless, in modern medicine, modern science, too. Uh, we should look at something like this, and let's say, in this particular case, I want to show you what, in one case, what we did with this information. We wanted to, we were aware at that time that cholesterol in the blood is pretty significant. You know, higher cholesterol, more heart disease. That was back in the 80s, 70s, 80s, somewhere in that period. Uh, so then some energetic uh, scientists came along and found out where is the cholesterol synthesized. It's not the cholesterol we're consuming, it's the cholesterol we make. Cholesterol is an important nutrient. It's vitally important. So we make our own cholesterol. So because we were concerned at that time that high cholesterol levels might be more heart disease risk, so somebody got the bright idea, well, let's create a chemical to block the senses of that cholesterol. And so they found a place in, that, in their scheme of things. Whoops. I don't know why this is doing this to me. Um, well, let me tell you this much if you work on that. But they, this chemical right here, which you can't see, it's acetylcholine. No, it's, it's, you spoil my... Back in the play now. You were in the play. I'm in the play, okay. Okay, I'm jumping in. That's okay, in the interest of time. So cholesterol starts here. One of the fundamental chemicals, acetylcholine is called, goes through a series of reactions. You make it cholesterol. That's normal. We have to make some cholesterol. We need that, absolutely. But the idea was let's block it. So they found a place to block it. They got a chemical to block it, you know, to keep your cholesterol down. Just one reaction. This is just or in one place, and they got a, a chemical, it's called statins. That was the birth of the statin industry. The statin industry was such that these particular chemicals, yes, they did have the property, could, it could block cholesterol synthesis, therefore you get a little lower cholesterol in the blood for sure, but does that really lead to the solution for heart disease? Not even close. There's various estimates of how effective they are or ineffective they are, and basically, the, the consensus is there's a lot of side effects. Get maybe get some benefit, maybe nine percent reduction in heart disease risk. It's kind of low, but look at compare that to the reverse of heart disease that Esselt and Ornish did. There's no comparison. Now we have an eighty billion dollar industry living on statins. You know, to solve the problem that we don't need to solve that way because if we eat the right food in the first place, it wouldn't happen. So that's, that's, a, that's an, um, an illustration of reductionism. Looking at one, one reaction, one chemical, coming in and trying to intercept it to try to get the results. It doesn't really work. Here's one on cancer, my, my area. And the National Cancer Institute, which is the leading voice in this field, maintains that cancer is a genetic disease. It starts with genes, eventually gives rise to cancer, right? The genes are getting expressed. And so the whole idea is that amongst the people in the cancer industry, they want you to think that we are a product of our genes. We get cancer whether or not according to which genes we have or don't have. There's a little bit of truth in a couple of that in some small number of cases. But basically, they maintain it's a genetic disease. I say, no, it's not. Cancer is not a genetic disease because that what that infers if we have the genes to give rise to cancer, we're going to get cancer at some point or another. Therefore, if, we, if cancer is, is a genetic disease, that means once the cancer starts growing, it's not going to come back because mutations don't reverse. So the general consensus in the cancer industry for the last several decades has been cancer is a sort of inexorable, prog is on a, a progressive platform. If you get the genes, you're going to get cancer. It's not the genes, because that's what we showed in our animal studies early on. It's the expression of the genes that matter. So we all can have some genes. We all do. We all got some genes we'd rather not have. Might get this, that, or something else. But quite frankly, nutrition comes into play if it's the right kind with that breadth of effect. It keeps all those genes, on, it keeps the bad genes under control. Promotes the good genes. Again, in fact of nature. It's a fascinating idea. That's where nutrition, the essence of nutrition really is. So I say it's, it's not a genetic disease. Um, okay, cancer is 
is a product of the a, a nutritional expression of these genes that matter. Um, and just to throw this into a little more, more turmoil, cancer treatment. You know the cost of building a dr cancer drug. The industry sells, they'll use their figures. It costs about two and a half billion dollars to make one new cancer drug. Two and a half billion, that's a B. Now there's some estimates that's too high because they threw in opportunity costs and cost of investment and so forth, alternative investment. So somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion, billion three or something. But still, that's a lot of money we're spending on cancer drugs. And that's the principal way we actually are treating cancer patients. I would like to see the day come when we can actually try nutrition on this. In fact, I've been harping away about this to some extent. No one wants to believe this is even possible because you can't reverse cancer. When we did in experimental animals, I can tell you if I took the data I had from the experimental animals, and got the results to show, and it's published to see, and they can see for themselves. If I went to some group of investors, said, hey, I, I look at these results I got. You know, I found this piece of bark down in the Brazil, in a giant, and I actually laid this compound in there, and now here's the results I got. I feel like I get to get $2 billion worth of investment tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is, that's the way the system works. In reality, it's the food, it's the nutrition that works together. And to try to pick out a single chemical to do the work that we'd like to have done is not necessarily working that way. Um, and it turns out, furthermore, and this is a fairly recent, uh, rep well, written 10 years ago, Somebody went back, a group of Australian and U.S. Uh, cancer researchers got their hands on a lot of data on cancer patients around most of the United States and sort of asked the question, are we getting results from all that chemotherapy? It turns out in that kind of exercise, they learned that, that on average, for all of 20 different cancers, chemotherapy drugs and so forth, they increased five-year survival by only 2.1%. So here we're spending huge amounts of money. Here's the results we get. They're really not working. Now there's some promising ones that here and there might work. That's true enough. But as, as a strategy for actually dealing with a complex disease like that or with heart disease, we're spending a lot, a lot of money, causing a lot of pain and people dying early because we're taking the wrong, wrong strategy. We're not talking about what really matters, and that's nutrition which happens to have a lot of side effects, pretty good side effects at that. Um, I'm going to skip over here because I know I can't, I'm borrowing from your time. I won't do this right now, but um, let me, let me chip. So here, look back at this chart. If we look at a chart like that, and it's far, far more complicated than that, so, you know, a thousand times more complex than that. If we hope to understand all these reactions and see one that we like to you know, stop, if you will, get a chemical, call it a drug, test it, and so forth and so on. It, we may see some results in the short term amongst a few people. But also we see side effects, bad side effects. We also see tolerance built up. And so the long haul drugs is not the way to go, I would argue. I call this a drug protocol. One reaction in that mix there. In contrast, uh, the nutrition protocol, and here's the beauty of nutrition. You eat the right food. Okay, all the stuff is in plants for the most part. It's all good. It's all working together. It's addressing all of those reactions simultaneously that may be causing us mischief. It's a dramatically different view of what the whole world of medicine is about, medical research is all about. If we use food, we can get these results far superior than have to rely just on drugs. So this is really a, a contest between the two worlds. Uh, and I call this holistic nutrition. Multiple nutrients, multiple mechanisms, multiple disease reversals. Mul I mean, there you have it, just everything. Follow that pathway. There's a highly interactive, integrated holistic system minus the cult of animal protein. I've, as I say, I've just finished working on another book and I've really become impressed with this whole story about protein. How did we get to the point where we revere animal protein so highly? I did, my, I did my doctoral dissertation on that because we revered it. We were going to treat children in the Philippines by making sure they got protein. That was the wrong track. And that's been going on for a long time. So the question is, where did we get that idea from that we should eat animal protein? 
or let's say animals themselves. Where'd that come from? It's an interesting question. Because throughout the history of protein since 1839 when it was discovered, there's lots of things you can see has happened because we're, we're locked in step with that idea. We're not gonna give it up. And so we end up, you know, paying subsidies to grow animal food for us so we can create more sick people Sick people being in turn triggered by drugs. The whole thing is screwed up. <laughs> it's really messed up. And it comes down to, really, I would argue, it's come down to a very simple concept of nutrition. We, people don't understand nutrition. We work with nutrition one nutrient at a time, put in a pill maybe. You know, it's this reductionism extraordinaire. It's, it's, it's out of sight. And if we all just sit back and just try to understand what is nature, how does she work? How does she work? She creates harmony at the cellular level, harmony at the sort of organism level. And, and it really is a fascinating idea. And it's because, as I say, it's, it's kind of a, a challenge for the way we think these days. But somehow we have to figure out to get, get back to that point. And now with the ar argument that's obviously arising now on the environment, that's the one, that's the one that may cause us to get serious. Because if we can't take care of that problem, all the rest of the stuff I'm talking about here is nonsense. We're not gonna be here even to think about it. So I, I would argue that among priorities that we should think about these days is really putting a great deal of focus on what do we mean to say when we do say that the chief cause of environmental problems is eating meat. It's that simple. And the only way we can actually get to that point, it seems like to me, amongst those who are making decisions, is to understand what nutrition can do. Really understand it. It's, an, it's, it's uh, it, it, there's no other way <laughs> to think about it. Yeah. This is my answer to my um, question I posed. Reductionist medicine, medicine is a whole discipline in itself, and we in medical research do the same thing. We tend, we tend to think, that's we, one disease, one cause, one mechanism, one drug treatment, that's reductionism. And that's why nutrition is not taught in a medical school in the United States. Because the practice of medicine itself, or medical research, I say clinical or medical, that we don't honor nutrition. There's not a single medical school in the United States that really teaches nutrition, right, Ron? That's the way it is. You have to ask yourself, why, do, why aren't physicians taught this? If they are taught it, we don't have a mechanism in place for them to really get reimbursement. That's the other side of the coin. You know, where there's a, what, something like 130 medical medical specialties, I think, run under Medicare. And so you, you not you, <laughs> but uh, you know, to, to get reimbursement, look at a patient, write down some numbers, get reimbursed from the drug company and so forth according to those 130. Of the 130 medical specialties that a doctor may assign to a patient, of the 130 medical specialties, do you know there's not one called nutrition? How in the world? I mean, they, they're, they're, our doctors are our premier people. They're the ones in touch with the public. If they're not taught to something, if they can't get reimbursed for the services they provide, and on top of it, throw one more in here, NIH was the, the largest research funding agency for medical research in the world. It's easily the most prominent. It's made up of 27 different institutes, 27, 28. Among those institutes, and they funded virtually all of my research, among those institutes, there's not one called that's dedicated to nutrition. Nutrition is just eliminated from our official discussions. So we have guidelines coming out on food, which are kind of ridiculous. This that's kind of leaning on our biases because they make money. We're not talking about what nutrition could do in terms of creating health for everyone all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, we'll take a few questions. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. You had this slide up about, you had this slide up where it showed a sandwich and the top of the sandwich was all supplements. So I was under the impression that I was told that 50 years ago the soil had a plenty of nutrients, but because today the soil is so depleted, you're not really getting the nutrients, and so you really need some of the supplements. So what's the story? Because it's the supplements, it's a billion dollar, I spend a fortune on supplements, but only because I was told there's, the soil is so depleted, you now need supplements. That's an excellent question. This one's been hanging around for quite a while. Uh, and there's some truth in it, by the way. Um, we now have depleted soils, and this happened very quickly in the last two or three decades, four decades. We have depleted soils for sure. And the evidence that I'm familiar with shows some reduction in nutrient content in those plants growing on those soils. However, uh, I, don't want to, I, I don't think that should dominate our conversation. Because what's left, what we still have, is still very good. It may not have quite the nutrient content it does, but remember what I was saying before, we're eating excess of nutrients under the old system. And we can still get a lot of health by using the foods we now have. Now to, let's say, address that problem, the extent to which it exists, we go back and do what Dr. Weiss is doing. You know, let's, let's create, let's restore soil health. Let's figure out how to do that. Let's not start just using a bunch of chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, it all seem, seem to funnel down, it's triangulates down into a problem. But don't, don't lose sight. You don't need to use the uh, supplements either to make up for the difference. You, you're getting plenty of, of all the protein you want, all the nutrients you want, just by eating the food. You Just go along the aisle in the grocery store where the uh, produce is. Hang out there. Get some cereal grains. And you'll be fine. You don't need any nutrient supplements. I don't know any case where nutrient supplements really work for those who eat well. There's one, one possible exception to vitamin B12. B12 is, uh, uh, my colleagues in the clinic will argue that they've seen B12 deficiencies that can be remediated by supplementation. So, I, okay, that, that's possible because B12 is not produced by animals, not produced by humans. We're all, it's produced by bacteria in the soil. Another case where, so I might need some B12. That's, uh, I'll go along with that. But uh, to rely on, um, all the others, and assuming that we're not getting enough nutrients of this kind or that kind, and then taking supplements, that doesn't make sense. Can, can I have the money you spent? <laughs> <laughs> I hate to be so negative, but that's, I'm just gonna tell <laughs> Hi, I've been coming here for about six months and learning a lot. But each of the speakers that I uh, see are, I'll put it nicely, mature. Uh, how can we encourage younger uh, physicians and, and people to come and embrace this type of lifestyle? Good question. Uh, number one, I teach uh, nutrition in medical schools, the kind that I find that's effective. And that can be done. This is where the federal government can have a hand. They, don't get, they won't give any more federal subs any kind of support to medical schools unless they demonstrate they're teaching nutrition properly. That's one thing. Second thing, let's add a specialty in there where doctors can actually charge for their services called nutrition. That's the second thing. Young people, um, young people are getting turned on better than us older guys. They're, they're, not, they're, they're getting energized, I think, in large measure by the environmental questions. We see that. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's an excellent question, but I mean, it really is. You know, how do we get this thing turned around? The biggest challenge we have is the fact that, in theory, I'm arguing, you know, I, I believe we can actually save 70 to 80 percent of our total health care costs tomorrow if everybody did this. No question about that. But what does that mean? Loss of jobs. There's a lot of jobs in there. If we just completely upend what we now have in the various society forms, a lot of jobs are being lost. We can't do that, obviously. That's a resistance point. 
but let's get sit around collectively at least and think. If this information is true, why don't we start thinking about how do we can create uh, new opportunities, new jobs? I come from the farm, and I am very sensitive to the fact that in the farm, the family farm was big in my day. Everybody had family farms. They've almost been swallowed up by the factory farms to produce food that we don't need. It's really ridiculous. So we got to get back to the countryside. What, what Dr. Weiss is doing here. Get young people trained and understand nutrition is important. Here's what you do. Here's the food you produce. Here's the food we have to eat to get that nutrition. And here's how you produce it. I, I don't know. It's just off the top of my head, but I think, uh, but your question is right to the point. We got to get young people involved. Dr. Campbell, if I may add something, this young gentleman's question. So for those of you who don't know, you know, I am a, I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School where I graduated from. And f I think this is the first time in the country that I'm aware of that medical school has, a, which you pay for with your tax dollars, has approved an official syllabus uh, and a rotation for senior medical students to come here for a month. So we, they come, they not only come to our practice, they not only see patients, they not only learn about the work that started with Dr. Campbell, they see whole nutrition in action, they see that list of diseases that Dr. Campbell showed, they see them going away, they see people coming off their medications, they then have mandatory days where they have to go into the field with Nora and they, uh, they start to learn where the nutrients come from in the soil, how we have to treat the soil, how they then are translated into plants and how they are eaten and their connections to the environment. So we do have that and I just wanted to give a shout out to Jody Cass and Plant Pure Communities for partnering with Dr. Clapper. How many of us know Dr. Clapper? Okay. So Dr. Clapper um, is working with Plant Pure Communities to go around the nation and, and the world to speak to medical students who are in medical school to let them know about um, the power of what Dr. Campbell is talking about. You know, I didn't say this before Dr. Campbell got up, but uh, the sort of the idea for this, this, we like to call this the first farm-based healthcare system in the world. The idea for this in my head came from the, um, when I closed the last pages of the China study. And it was from that idea of whole systems that you talked about influencing human health and considering how fragmented our medical system and how reductionist it is cannot be healthcare. And when I closed that book, that's when I began to realize that putting everything together with the farming and the food and the way it's produced and teaching medical students really was the way to go. Dr. Clapper today has um, a um, relationship with Plant Pure Communities and you can see Jody Cass about that. It's called Moving Medicine Forward where he goes out and reaches and lectures to medical <laughs> students to bring this to them. And Jody, is he getting a great response? Yes, yes. If anyone has, has kids or nephews or nieces or aunts or uncles who are involved in medical school, there's a, a, a clinic on his website. You can actually suggest. Uh, he doesn't get invited in through the front door. He comes in through the back door. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, the administration of the medical school tries to block his entry. So he can only go in surreptitiously from the young people who are really desiring. This is more of a thank you for all of your research and dedication. My mom was diagnosed with cancer several years ago and was very heartfelt about your studies. Unfortunately, it was too late for her. But when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was full on and my oncologist, everybody fired me because I refused the medication. 
the treatments, and I'm still here. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming. That, that's a great story. I, my wife also, a related thing, I wrote this in whole. Uh, she was diagnosed. We were pretty much there where we were, should be, let's say, but not completely. And uh, she got uh, diagnosed with advanced melanoma. That's pretty bad. Uh, and so uh, I went along as a dutiful husband, listening to her go to the, go to the doctor. And he, he basically, what he had set up for her, since it was in her lymph glands, take out her lymph glands, you know, that, that was going to be a tough thing to do for a year. And then start medicine chemo. And she told him she didn't want to do either. He was furious, really, really kind of angry. You come back here in six months, I can do nothing for you, kind of attitude. That's really what he said. That was 16 years ago, no problem. Thank you so much for all your extraordinary work and your dedication. I just have a question. If you're, let's say, a 50-year-old meat-eating person living in New York City and diagnosed with stage 3 or 4 cancer, your first place to go would be like a Sloan Kettering. In your opinion, where would you go instead? Home. Home. <laughs> No, like where no. would you like I, I don't I'm being a little bit facetious there maybe. I mean obviously that kind of problem needs to be attended to. At least a professional should evaluate it and see where you are and make you aware of uh, the situation. But then from there on really um, I said be careful here. I don't ha I'm not uh, you know, I'm re registered as a physician so I can't practice medicine. Well I am. But, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where we took my father. So when I, when I was um, A year after I had uh, finished my residency, my father was diagnosed with end-stage, widely spread metastatic pancreatic cancer, and we took him to Sloan Kettering. And he was, we met with the, because I come from a family of doctors, we could only meet with the department chairman. It wasn't like one of the other professors. And they gave my father like one to three months to live. They said, they had chemo, but they said it really probably wouldn't work, and so we just took him home. And so this was before the China study. This was in 1991. And I happened to find a colleague of Dr. Campbell's, who was Michio Kushi, who recommended a type of a whole plant food diet. And uh, we took my father home because he just didn't, he didn't want to be sick for the month he had left. And over the next months, he had documented by CAT scans a 50% reduction of all of his massive tumors. He lived for a year and a half with an excellent quality of life, which he would have never had if he had accepted any treatments from Sloan Kettering. You know, I think at the end of the day, he couldn't overcome his problem because it was too far gone. But I tell every cancer patient that um, there is a whole food plant-based diet at a high level is always a benefit in a cancer patient. Even cancer patients who choose to take chemotherapy. It's still, we see it, right, Asha, in our patients all the time. It extends their life. It improves their functional status. They're stronger. They don't get infections. They move better. They sleep better, they live longer, they have better quality of life. I believe there's a Dr. Forsythe in Nevada that does a uh, whole food plant based approach, close to keto. Have you heard of that? No. no, I have not, but I think, you know, if at the end of the day, when someone comes to me, I tell them, look, if chemo, if, if a, a standard treatment, is proven that it can give you a significantly improved outcome, um, take it. But unfortunately, most chemo, as Dr. Campbell alluded to, does not do that. Um, 
Sure. So uh, Jody was mentioning True North. I don't. Does everyone know what that is? Yeah. yeah. True North is a uh, is probably the foremost fasting um, center in the world. They have the most experience, not only with not eating, but with eating too. A, a high level of whole plant foods. And um, just to give you an example, uh, Dr. Goldhammer, um, and I know this is one case, but it's a dramatic case. Um, ha and um, Dr. I guess Goldhammer, I don't know if Dr. Clapper was on that, but uh, they published a case in the British Medical Journal, which is like one of the greatest journals in the world, of an advanced case of um, lymphoma B cell lymphoma, which was completely cured with fasting and eating. No, and I just spoke to Dr. Goldhammer a while ago, uh, about a couple of months ago. There's still no evidence after years of recurrence in this woman. Ron, we need to wrap it up, Ron. Yeah. Uh, I'll take uh, one, one more. Could you just address that medical study that was published this week that recommended people continue with the uh, processed food and, and animal uh, meat? Good question. Great yeah, question. I'm more than happy to make a comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a travesty. It's an immoral act. Uh, I, there were 19 authors. Uh, I, I can't get the names here, but... Uh, there's one that was a key person, the leader of that. I know that person very well. Uh, that person has taken, to me, taken it to me for the last 15 years, for starters. Um, well, I, know, I shouldn't have said that, but <laughs> they, they, that, that, that group is seriously biased, not necessarily because they got funding. I don't want to speak to that because I don't have, I don't know the evidence, but they uh, are like, too many others are just so anxious to defend the status quo. And they're, they're actually, uh, they're basing uh, the, uh, their arguments, if you will. The main argument in that study was that they're rating all the different ki kinds of studies, and they give each kind of study a rating of quality, if you will. Those studies that are randomized clinical trials are receive a number one. Those studies that are called observational, just correlations, they're near the bottom. And so on that basis, yes, they come up with some evidence that doesn't look so great. But the problem is the randomized controlled trial, I wouldn't give it a one, I'd give it a zero. Because that's that kind of approach is for drug evaluation. That's not for nutrition, so they can't ever see it that way. Secondly, are the correlation studies that they're using, they say so low, I'm putting them high on the list. Because it, it gets a little technical here, you may have heard that correlations does not, not, not equal causation. That's for population-based studies. And I'm sorry, I'm probably going over the head here. But uh, that kind of study is true if you're looking for a single thing. That's not what I'm looking for. If you do correlation studies, and we've done these kind of things, it's, they have a lot of power. So the premise for that group to analyze the data the way they did is dead wrong. It's flat out wrong. Uh, and it's enough said, I'm in, the, in this new book I, I explain that in more detail. They've gone off the rails and they're only simply just trying to defend what we're now doing. Yeah, the New York Times this morning uh, actually published a uh, retraction on that article. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah, a clarification. Uh, I can say this much, he was the head of our department for 10 years. Oh. And here and I were at like this. I, I don't want to say more than that, but you know, it's, I'm, I've written about him in, in the book. <laughs> but that's, that's good to hear. That's great, that's fantastic. When is your book coming out? Pardon? I'm not sure yet. We just finished writing it. Uh, when I say we, I, I wrote the book, but uh, my co uh, it's my grandson, actually. Uh, he uh, graduated from the university, University of North Carolina, 
started out in a class of 400 in this particular program of writing. At the end, at the senior year, he's the one who got the number one award. He's a fantastic writer. So, however well the book reads, I wanted everybody to know that he's the one that <laughs> really did a lot. But I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping uh, sometime soon, because it's already done, it'll take a little bit of copy editing, that sort of thing, but maybe it's spring. Yeah. <laughs> okay.